I bid thee welcome. I perceive thou art strangers that would see and know this loveliest relic of all America, this little faraway island of the Indians. Be assured that the years have not dimmed the lure of this beauty and romance. But we must not linger. There is much to see, and nimbler feet than mine must be thy guide this day. So I return to that boon from whence I came, and leave thee with my thrice great granddaughter. How quaint! For a moment I imagined myself back in the old days of the 1700s, welcoming you as would have my great, great, great grandmother Abigail, for whom I was named. Please call me Abby, and let me be your guide, for I know that would be her wish. Here in our cottage hangs a map of the early days. It was on the shore of this small lake, then open to the sea, that the first white settlers landed in 1659. A spot near the present water tower became the site of the original town of Sherbrooke. Leader of the group was Thomas Macy, a Quaker, who was accompanied by his wife and children. Also in the group were Edward Starbuck, Isaac Coleman, and a boy. A colony grew up but in 1673, this unprotected spot was abandoned for the more desirable location on the harbor some three miles east. Not until 1795 was the name changed to Nantucket. By this time, the success of the whaling industry had transformed the settlement into a thriving commercial town. Today, many of the winding lanes and cobbled streets of that period still remain along with some of the original dwellings. Our stroll begins on Main Street, where the cobbles are polished by the traffic of more than a hundred years. Blades of grass press up between the stones in verdant hope, and the wine glass elms stand like stately sentinels. At the foot of the street to the east stands the old Roch warehouse, now used by the town's court and sheltering the captain's club. Here, in 1773, were signed the charters for the ships Beaver, Eleanor, and Dartmouth, which later lost their cargoes in the historic Boston Tea Party. Looking from the east, we see the Pacific Bank, through which pass the fabulous wealth of the Nantucket whalers. Out of the reeking holds of those rugged sailing ships poured a flood of whale oil that made Nantucket, in 1822, the richest town in the New World. Mementos of that colorful period still greet the visitor in the windows of quaint antique shops. Here on Upper Main Street is one of the original meeting houses of the Quakers. It is now a part of the main building of the Nantucket Historic Society. At the crest of the hill, we find the Hallett House, classic in its lines and notable in New England architecture. 
There are few doorways that do not encroach upon the sidewalk. This was an old world idea designed to leave more garden space in the rear. The whaling era made its contribution to island architecture in the form of the captain's walk. From this vantage point, the lonely wife would scan the horizon with her spyglass as she waited for the return of her seafaring husband. For the voyages sometimes lasted four years. As we reach Trader's Lane, the street narrows. The houses are packed close together and the walls are higher. On the right are the three bricks built by Joseph Starbuck. In direct contrast are the Georgian and Greek revival styles shown in these two houses by William Hadwin. This group of houses was the first outlet for the huge profits piling up from the greasy luck voyages of the 1840s. The many brick homesteads here are nearly all from this era. This is Macy House. Conforming to a modified design of an earlier epoch, it is rich in dignity of contour. Its doorway and fanlight are listed among the notable early designs and have been widely copied. In a different style is a neighboring home, the Toby House. One of the treasures of the founding days, it was moved three miles from the village of Sherburne. Its lean-to, the sign of an expanding family, marks it as an example of secondary design in island architecture. A short walk down Pleasant Street takes us to another beautiful brick, named the Moor. The large gardens are quite the most beautiful of the many choice flower beds on the island. Blooming here, in the open, are many varieties rarely found outside of the hothouse. Mitchell Ray the fourth generation of light ship basket weavers chats with us about his art and his basket. We're fortunate in finding Mitchie himself seated on the doorstep of the shop built by his grandfather over 100 years ago. In passing, we must note a few of the better known doorways and knockers. Many of the knockers are of hand wrought silver and no two are alike. These are prizes in the eyes of any antiquarian and the chances are that next time you're on Main Street, you'll stop in one of the antique stores. Yes, there are some originals yet to be had, along with others that are frankly sold as copies. As we ramble these old streets, relics of the past frequently come to our attention in ship figureheads and ornaments. Hallowed reminders of the old whaling fleet of hundreds of gallant ships that brought wealth, fame, and imperishable history to our island. Perhaps the best known of all the island's objects of historical interest is the oldest house, built in 1686. This weather-beaten relic of the pioneer days was built by the father of Jethro Coffin as a wedding present for his son upon his marriage to 16-year-old Mary Gardner. Curious indeed is the inverted horseshoe ornament fashioned in brick on the chimney, supposedly a permanent safeguard against witches. The casement windows are glazed with diamond-shaped panes set in lead mullions. By the front door is a small shuttered port, so that those within could see whether a friendly neighbor or hostile Indian was without before unbarring the door. The heavy timbers bear evidence that in 1686, security and permanency were the dominant ideas of the builders. The Elihu Coleman House, built in 1722, is the second oldest house on the island. It is now owned and occupied by Elizabeth Hollister Frost, who wrote This Side of Land a delightful island epic built around this venerable homestead. Coleman occupied the house for 60 years, and as an elder of the Society of Friends, 
drew up the first anti-slavery proposal. While it is true that the island was dominated by the Quakers for the first 100 years, other denominations grew in number and required meeting places. The gilded dome of the South Tower, the Unitarian House of Worship, is a prominent landmark. The black dial and gold numerals of the town clock in the tower are visible from almost any point in town. In the belfry hangs the melodious Portuguese curfew bell, brought from Lisbon in 1815 by the captain of a whaler. At nine each evening, it sends 52 silvery strokes vibrating through the stillness of the island night. The congregational edifice, North Church, dates from 1711 for the original building, which was moved in 1765 from its original site two miles away to become the vestry of the present church. The main structure, an example of severe Gothic purity of line, was added in 1834. The Baptist Church on Summer Street is noted for having one of the most graceful spires in New England. At first glance, it is unimpressive, but closer study reveals its unique contour. In the center of the town stands the modern edifice of the Roman Catholic parish. The Episcopal Church is a handsome, ivy-covered brick and brownstone structure built in 1901. In the old days, nearly every church had its graveyard, and these of the island are of special interest. Although many of the headstones are illegible, there are some curious epitaphs that can still be deciphered. Not far from the graveyard is another venerable object of interest. 200 years ago, Nathan Wilbur erected three windmills on the south edge of town using material salvaged from coastal wrecks. East Mill is still in operation and regularly grinds small packets of corn for visitors. For a nominal fee, you can get enough making for a super Johnny cake. Here by the roadside is the Benjamin Franklin Spring and the fountain erected by the Massachusetts DAR as a memorial to his mother, Abaya Folger Franklin, whose grave is nearby. The little gray lady has never quite forgiven Benjamin's mother for going to the continent for his advent. High in the list of notable men and women born in Nantucket is Maria Mitchell, who became, in 1865, professor of astronomy at Vassar College. As a girl, she studied astronomy under her father. And later, in 1847, Miss Maria stood on the roof of the Pacific Bank building and discovered the comet that bears her name while peering through the lens of her homemade telescope. The Memorial Observatory enshrines her instrument and other relics. Near at hand is the place where Lucretia Mott was born in 1793. She is remembered today as the first champion of women's suffrage. The list of the famous in Nantucket is long, but the little gray lady had her bad ones as well. By 1805, when the town's population had reached 9,000, a jail was built. The heavy hand-forged bars seem incongruous in their framework of wood siding and shingles. The wharves of whaling days are still scenes of activity, although nothing remains of the original construction. The commercial fishing vessels that lie at dock today would be dwarfed by an old-time whaling ship but they nevertheless give a good account of themselves in the heavy seas of the Newfoundland banks. The story of the island would not be complete without a trip to the Athenaeum and the Whaling Museum with their wealth of historical relics. Now let's slip away to the modern side of the island. On the way, we pass many beautiful homes and gardens overlooking the ocean. The beaches, both private and public, are splendidly supervised. The fine white sand is free from pebbles and shells, 
and the average water temperature is 72 degrees. Modern beach equipment adds to the enjoyment. Lunch is served on dainty beach table trays under your umbrella or in cool canteens. Here the children can play in safety. Or pause to watch occasional stunts by the lifeguard. On our way back to town, we pass the Yacht Club, an important center of social activity. Tennis is popular with the younger set. For those who don't mind frequent ducking, water skiing is first choice. Horses are available for guests to enjoy a canter over the miles of rolling moors. And of course, sailing craft of all sizes are at your disposal. To top it all off, there's fishing in the harbor, free bicycling tours, a nature hike, and just plain loafing. And while you relax, you may want to amuse yourself by feeding the seagulls during lunch at one of the waterside restaurants. And now let's drive along the seven-mile road to Sconset, where we can see another oldest house and the ancient Sconset village pump. 1776. Guarding the shores is far-famed San Katie Lighthouse, which stands farther out to sea than any other Atlantic coast beacon. Passing through the village on the Bluff Road, we view attractive summer homes and seaside hotels. As the road winds inland, we come to the small cluster of cottages, still known as the Actors' Colony. This secluded spot was discovered in 1884 by the late George Fawcett and soon became a hideaway for leading figures of the theatrical world. Here in the summer came the Thespian nobility of the day. Francis Wilson, William Russell, Mrs. Gilbert, William Courtney, Isabel Irving, Bigby Bell, Bob Hilliard, Mary Mannering, Hopper, Jennings, Busico, and others. Today, only the rose-covered roof remain to remind us of those days and nights filled with merriment and music. As we cross the moors on our way to Tom Nevers Head, we pass the traditional battleground of the two hostile Indian tribes that once lived on the island. From this elevation, we can look out over the treacherous shoals, nemesis of many a gallant ship. These waters were also the scene of naval engagements during the Revolutionary War. And now, dear friends, if you will drop me at our cottage door, I will say goodbye, hoping that our visit together has awakened an enduring fondness for our island. Our visitors leave their gracious guides their thoughts still lingering among the romantic memories of this historic isle. Tomorrow, they board the sturdy ship that will take them out of the harbor, past Brent Light and the jetties, and back to the continent. As they stand at the taffrail, they take one last look at the gilt dome of old South Tower and recall again the silver voice of the ancient Portuguese bell.
pass the big lightship with the rip, they salute this hardy guardian and say their final farewell to Nantucket. Through the days and years, this island of beauty and romance will live in their memories until at last they return again to the little gray lady of the sea.